Hi, I'm James Verdeer, and welcome to the American Institute of Biological Sciences Bioscience Talks, which is a forum for integrating the life sciences and where we discuss the latest bioscience publications. As a reminder, if you'd like to read more, point your browser to academic.oup.com forward slash bioscience. Today's episode is the next in our In Their Own Words oral history series, in which we talk with scientists who've made great contributions to their fields, particularly within the biological sciences. This week's guest is Dr. Thomas Lovejoy, professor at George Mason University, explorer at large with the National Geographic Society, and Senior Fellow at the United Nations Foundation. He is also a past president of AIBS. Let's go to the discussion. Dr. Lovejoy, thank you very much for joining me today. Well, delighted to be with you. Okay, so our first question is, when did you first know that you wanted to work in the life sciences? Well, you know, I think it was, it was probably before I was 15 uh, because I had had a biology course that basically covered the variety of life on earth, plants and animals. And I was just so excited about it. I just knew I wanted to engage with that for the rest of my life. Uh, did I know I would go on and do a PhD? No, but I certainly knew enough that I majored in biology as an undergraduate and finally you know, got up the gumption to go for the PhD. What drove the decision to go for the PhD? Was it any class in particular or was it you know, just general interest in a number of subjects? Actually, it was a sense that there was still a lot more to learn. And, 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 and when I say learn, I mean learn how to do, which is what a PhD is all about. And I wasn't sure that I had what it took, but I finally swallowed hard and gave it a try and it worked. And did you have, you know, future career plans in mind when you embarked upon that? Or, you know, is that sort of something that kind of comes along later in, in the process? Well, basically, I fancied a life where I would work for an institution that would allow me to go around the world having scientific adventures and would require me to return to the institution quite infrequently, but often enough to keep their support. Um, now, did I, did I have any notion that my trajectory would take me on a world which would interface with policy? Uh, no, but I also, I also every, every advisor and teacher I had uh, all gave value to conservation. So that was that was tucked away in the back of my mind when an opportunity opened up to become employee number 13 for a little organization called the World Wildlife Fund United States. And that was 1973. Uh, and they weren't looking for a PhD, but we decided to take a chance on each other. And I thought after two years, I'd go back on the science adventure track. And I stayed 14 and the rest is history. What was that organization like at that time, you know, as, as employee number 13? I think, you know, we're all very familiar with it as a very large organization with considerably more than 13 employees. Well, you know, it was, it was a really exciting time uh, to be working on this case conservation. Uh, because it was really the the golden age under the Nixon and Ford administrations where most environmental laws and institutions actually were put in place by moderate Republicans, much to the astonishment of people who have ever stopped to think about it. Uh, so it was a, it was a time when a lot was possible. Uh, and there was not a lot of pushback on, on environmental initiatives. Um, so 1975 was the Endangered Species Act, for example. I remember testifying about that. Uh, that was my very first testimony was to testify for a WWF for the Endangered Species Act in front of Senator Chafee from Rhode Island. That's fascinating. So what do you attribute that to, you know, the relative ease of doing 
you know, environmental policy work at that time, you know, was it that the large moneyed interests had not yet, you know, kind of turned their sights to uh, combating those types of environmentalist activities at that time? Or, or was it something else? Well, I think it was a combination of things. Uh, first of all, environment had become a matter of global importance uh, with the UN conference on uh, in 1972, uh, environmental consciousness, you know, s spread like a wave across the United States, uh, demonstrations and Earth Day and all the rest of it. So there, there were very few people who had reservations. Everybody thought doing things for the environment was a good idea. Uh, and you had moderate Republicans in the White House, and uh, Nixon was not an environmentalist, but he thought it was good for him politically. Um, and actually, there's a, a great story. Uh, when Russ Train was head of CEQ, he was the first head of CEQ, um, he didn't have very much one-on-one -on -one time with Nixon just because Nixon wasn't interested particularly. Uh, but he was in the Oval Office with the president one morning uh, and the president starts going off about environmentalists and, and how when he went to Key Biscayne and went golfing, he couldn't see the ocean because those damned environmentalists wouldn't allow them to cut the mangroves <laughs> and it's got a real head of steam going and just at that moment the famous filipino steward comes in with fresh coffee and nixon says and everybody knows all mangroves are good for our goony birds right manolo no mr president that's not right when was the last time that was said in the White House? Uh, and he proceeded to explain to the president that on his day off in Key Biscayne, he went, went fishing and how important the mangroves were as nurseries for fisheries. Uh, I, I couldn't resist telling you that story anyway. <laughs> No, that's a great one and interesting and, and, you know, kind of illustrative of the way things uh, change and can be certainly different over the course of history. Uh, so, so basically in your question is, is also why did it change? Um, and I think part of it was just the accumulation of of change that was being required. Inevitably, there were some people who, you know, got, got angry about it. Um, but there also was a deliberate moment in the Reagan campaign when environment began to be used by the Republicans as a negative. Prior to that, it had been a bipartisan issue. Uh, and it has just been reinforced, you know, time and time again ever since uh, in ways that really do disrespect to what environmental issues are all about and to what they mean for people. And, you know, I, I think the greatest environmental injustice issues of all time are or the kind of planet and climate we're going to leave future generations. Uh, but that's not being particularly well recognized. Yeah, I mean, that's certainly alarming. So it's it. it and I think that that's a, you know, refrain that I've, I've heard a few times um, in conducting these interviews that around, you know, the, the early 80s, conservation began to appear as a wedge issue. And that sort of continued and has led to, you know, broadly speaking, the political climate that we're in now. Yeah, so there are also two or three other things that happened in those years which reinforced all of that. Uh, one was, I think, the diminishment of a sense of service 
uh, which started, you know, when the draft was no longer compulsory. But uh, I think the the sense of public service really has become lost over time. Uh, I think a sense of frugality that my parents' generation had from living through rationing in the war and the depression uh, has vanished. And there became this great emphasis on consumption, uh, a model that we've sort of offered the rest of the world uh, and not necessarily with good consequences uh, across the board. So it's been, it's been a, a bunch of things that were happening at the same time. That makes sense. And I, I'm assuming that you don't see an easy way out of that. Or do you see a path for, you know, restoring some of those values that had well served the program in the past? Well, you know, yes, I do. And, you know, inevitably it could get so bad that people throw up their hands and say, we have to do something about the environment. I don't, choose to hope that that's the way this is resolved. Uh, I hope that those of us who engage in all of these things will become more successful uh, in explaining and demonstrating the values of treating the environment in a more gentle way. And some of that will come through more thoughtful economics uh, you know, including the new report that Partha Dasgupta is leading for the UK Treasury, which is the economics of biodiversity, essentially intended to be a parallel to uh, the Stern report on climate change. Uh, so sometimes when you look at the, the challenges we're facing right now, it can look really discouraging. Uh, but every day there are new opportunities to make a change for the good, whether it's locally or conceptually or, what, or whatever. So I think there's every, every, every reason to be optimistic and engaged and try and make that future turn out better than current trajectories might imply. And let's certainly hope that people, you know, uh, take that up sooner rather than later. Uh, but for now, let's shift gears back to your career for a moment. And what would you say is the biggest surprise, if you had to name one, that you've encountered so far? The biggest surprise? Well, that's a really good one. Well, I guess the biggest surprise is the scale and rate of change. Um, so I'm thinking about a human population that is three times bigger than when I was born, uh, just to begin with. Uh, climate change that is far more advanced than one might have imagined, you know, when I was in graduate school. Um, and Amazon, which is very close to a tipping point where it's not enough forest to keep the hydrological cycle going. So there are a lot of things like that, which are on the discouraging side of the agenda. But then, you know, on the plus, plus side, uh, <clears throat> one, take a country like Brazil, which its current government notwithstanding has been an extraordinary leader in conservation and environment uh, going back to the Earth Summit and before and their deliberate decision to invite the Earth Summit to be in Rio. Uh, and so, you know, when I set foot in the Amazon, there was one national park in one indigenous area in 1965. That was it. And one, one national forest in the entire Amazon, an area equivalent to the 48 contiguous 
continental US states, right? Today, more than 50% of the Amazon is under some form of protection. Uh, about a quarter of it is in traditional conservation units. Uh, another quarter is in demarcated indigenous lands. And that's true of every one of the countries of the Amazon. And while it is not enough to support that hydrological cycle, uh, it is an absolutely extraordinary achievement. And I think we don't recognize and salute our achievements uh, with sufficient degree to offset all the discouragement of the latest, you know, bad thing that's happening to the environment, which, which is what gets the headlines. Yeah, I think that's a that's a very important point and one that I actually hope to revisit in, you know, future podcasts throughout the course of this year is the idea of the, you know, the successes of, uh, you know, evidence based and science based policy, uh, you know, where where the advice actually has been heeded and it's it's led to a, a positive outcome. Um, so I, 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 I may reach out to you again in the future and hope that you'll join me again and talk about some of those successes as well. Yeah. So, you know, I, I, I think in the end, uh, there will be a pendulum swing in public opinion back towards appreciating what science brings to everything. Uh, and as I like to say, the root word of science uh, is the word to know, right? So in the end, science has, has got reality on its side. That makes quite a lot of sense that you would hope that it would win out in the end. What do you think, and this, this may go back to uh, what you were just saying about Brazil, but what are the big differences between the way science is conducted now and the way that it was when you first entered the field? Well, that's a really, really interesting question. So, um, you know, when I was doing my dissertation, uh, basically, science was pretty much science just for science's sake. And sort of the applied implications uh, were always considered second order. Uh, and I think that's changed because there's so many huge problems in the world created by human action uh, that you can't solve them without studying them and studying how to fix them. Uh, and as I like to say, you actually learn a lot about ecosystems by watching them fall apart, uh, which in a sense is what I did with my forest fragments project in the middle of the Amazon. That's interesting. So it's a case in which you can get that observation while watching something's function actually deteriorate in the process. Yeah, so I mean, I was really lucky not only to have that idea, but to actually be able to do it. And I owe a lot of thanks to a lot of people and a lot of funding over more than 40 years. Um, but it, you know, it was, it was, it was really interesting. The, the Brazilians embraced the idea. They loved the idea of setting up this experiment. The, the ranches on, on which we set it up were delighted to be part of something that was getting media attention. Um, and it actually began to influence Brazilian conservation policy almost before a single paper was written because they suddenly started making all the protected areas large. Was that in, in response to, you know, the evidence that was coming out or the, the fact that they were able to see that, you know, that this was going to get some traction? Yeah. So, I mean, so what, what really made it work uh, so well was uh, that the, the ministry and agency in charge of creating parks and things like that was basically a, a technocratic delight. Right. So they all wanted to do the right thing scientifically. Uh, and it wasn't like we were urging them, you know, just to do something. It was because it made something 
made sense scientifically. Uh, and so the, the whole protected area system of Brazil and a lot of things were very seriously science-based for decades. Uh, and that, that cage is being rattled right now, but I think it will withstand it in the end and be strengthened. Uh, but that's why I worked. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, professional societies and, you know, what kind of role have they played in your career, uh, you know, either as a, uh, an early member or later as a leader? Well, you know, I started going to scientific society meetings uh, very early in graduate school. Uh, I might have even gone to one before I finished my undergraduate year, but I don't think so. Uh, and, you, and you did it because that's what you were supposed to do and it was fun and it was interesting always a little scary because you didn't want to look dumb in front of all these smart scientists uh, but basically you know it became part of what you just do as a scientist and i certainly encourage my own graduate students that way uh, you learn different things by going to scientific meetings uh, there's so much wonderful outcome of serendipitous things in these meetings that uh, you, you really come away a different person. Is that largely a function of just getting everybody together in a room? Well, yes, yes. And, you know, and staying up late and drinking beer and stuff. Uh, but it's also, you know, all the people who have put thought into developing a program uh, because that colors some of the discussion that goes on in the halls. Uh, so I, you know, personally, I find it an indispensable part of doing science. That's interesting. And so let's now talk about on the, the leadership side. Um, uh, do you have any, uh, f you know, favorite stories from your uh, time as president of AIBS? I remember my, I think it was the AIBS meeting where I was president. I think it was at the University of Indiana. Um, and the actual speech I gave was published in Bioscience. Uh, but I, I really sort of swallowed hard and decided that I was going to speak out about the state of the environment. Uh, and I did. Uh, and, you know, it was a polite audience. Nobody threw anything. And, uh, and on the way out, it was probably a thousand people in the audience. You know, it was big, it was in a gym, right? Uh, on the way out, uh, I'm, I'm behind two or three graduate students who didn't know I was behind them. I had used an analogy to a piece of music which gets louder and louder and more insistent uh, in the course of it. The name will come to me in a, in a minute. I mean, a very famous piece of music. Um, and so one of them was was saying, well, what is whatever that word was? It'll come to me. Uh, and then one of them said, I don't know, but I think it's a small mammal. Right? <laughs> <laughs> it really, I mean, it, it's, it's good to have something like that happen and bring you down a peg or two, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, what, what, uh, at that time though, did it feel like it it was you know um, you were going out on a limb to make you know bold statements about the state of the environment at that time? Yes, and it was you know it was it was treated quite respectfully actually, um, 
And uh, so I'm glad I did it. Um, and then of course, and right along about the same time, the Society for Conservation Biology was coming into existence. Uh, at the time it was the most rapidly growing scientific society period and 50% of its growth were graduate students, which was really interesting. So the major groundswell of support was coming from, you know, those who were youngest and newest in the field. Yeah, so that it, I mean, it, it was a reasonable support from, from uh, people already in the field, but the fact that students recognized its importance was really encouraging. What do you think fed that enthusiasm for the issue at that time in particular? You know, I think now it's obviously very you know customary for for scientists to make um, you know kind of bold statements about the environmental harms that are occurring. Uh, but if it wasn't so then, what ch what changed and made that more possible? Well, you know, I think I think there was a sense that we were collectively all of us at the beginning of a period where the pressures on on biodiversity were going to get greater and greater uh, and that there needed to be a science of dealing with that and um, so I was working for the World Wildlife Fund and I actually had started thinking about a conference of, of science for conservation uh, and um, Michael Soule sent Bruce Wilcox to see me. Bruce was his graduate student uh, and they wanted money to have the meeting which became the beginning of conservation biology. Uh, and I said, well, that's interesting because I've been thinking about that too. And so, yes, I'll, I'll persuade WWF to give you a grant to do that but I'm also giving you this outline I have in my desk drawer of some of the things I thought should be part of such a meeting. Um, and it was a rousing success. I mean, it was just, you know, the timing was right. What would you identify as, you know, your most challenging day on the job or, you know, perhaps the most, you know, kind of frightening or intimidating day on the job? Well, that's a really, really, really interesting question. I mean, there was a there was a time when a young scientist in Brazil accused me of being essentially, uh, I think, an intellectual pirate or something like that. Uh, that you know what I was doing with the Fragments Project was you know trying to s steal information and resources from Brazil. Uh, which of course was the farthest thing in the world for what it really was. Uh, and, you know, when you have somebody going around like that, basically, you know, accusing me of things uh, with no real ability to actually respond, uh, It's spooky because you don't know what it's going to lead to. Uh, the good news was that somebody at the Museo Geldi in Beilang, which is like a thousand miles from where the Forest Fragments Project works, but somebody who, who I did know actually went down to the local newspaper and gave them a whole earful about how important foreign collaboration was for science in Brazil. Uh, and that's when I began to breathe a little easier. Uh, there was a parliamentary commission of inquiry, which of course absolved me completely, uh, but it was something I would have preferred not to deal with. Of course. And yeah, you know, I think that that brings me to a question I, you know, I often find myself asking in these, which is, you know, how do you characterize the experience of being a scientist who has spent a lot of one's career 
doing things that are not under the traditional purview of what one thinks about as a you know an academic uh, you know hold, a holder of an academic position or a, you know um, a researcher you know whether that be testifying um, on the hill working it directly with you know uh, policymakers or you know doing PR and defending one's reputation um, or you know facing a commission um, you know in, in Brazil or those those types of things you know how has that been um, throughout the course of your career doing those types of things that are not what one would perhaps traditionally or immediately think of? Well, there are things you're not trained to do. Uh, graduate school doesn't teach you how to do those things, nor does it teach you how to solve problems, really. It teaches you how to master a field. So the course I give at Mason is, is on problem solving around challenges to biodiversity. Uh, so you have to learn as you go. Uh, and the first lesson you learn is to listen, right? So that it ends up being a conversation rather than a lecture that you're giving. Uh, and so, you know, I've been pretty good at that over time. And what that does is it creates a whole network of like-minded people you work with uh, in countries around the world. Uh, I think there's even a social science term for that. Um, uh, and so I, you know, over time I developed that. Uh, and luckily, I didn't make some hard mistake at the beginning, which made it very hard. So it's a, a matter of kind of, you know, building those relationships and building the experience over time and until, you know, the, you know you're, you're there and you're able to deal with those situations. Yeah. So, so, you know, I had a freshman advisor. He's the one who, who got me into the Amazon in Brazil. Uh, and he was always, you know, very enthusiastic about essentially just diving into the local culture and embracing it, uh, which meant that, you know, when I was doing my PhD, I was speaking Portuguese, uh, working in a essentially a Brazilian institution uh, enjoying it, even though it was the military era, but that was way down in the South. Uh, and so I think that sort of, it sort of uh, prepared me for some of the things I did later. And of course, you know, when I went to the World Wildlife Fund, uh, we very quickly had a symposium to set priorities because the program chair wanted to do that. And the priorities came out to be uh, new world science-based and tropics uh, because there was more biodiversity there even though the word didn't exist. Uh, and of course, World Wildlife Fund has gone way beyond that since then, but that's how we started. Uh, and you couldn't, do what needed to be done about that without involving Brazil and the Amazon. So I sort of had a leg up from the start that way. Um, you know, and all my Brazilian friends know my heart beats according to the samba. Uh, and that helps. Right? Yeah. How did you know to do that? Um, you know, had you studied Portuguese, you know, before you ever went to the Amazon or, um, you know, was it something that you eagerly picked up quickly? You know, where did that impulse to immerse yourself in the, you know, the nation and the culture and language, did that come from? So, so I did study it a, a bit before I went down, uh, but the rest of it, I just learned on the spot. Um, and like, you know, my first day out in the forest, with a field assistant who later actually was my field assistant for my PhD. 
uh, we basically communicated, you know, by pointing, you know, and I, I finally learned to say, you know, how do you say that and point at something and he'd give me the answer, right? Uh, and you just learn how to do it, right? And there was also, there also was a very strong, essentially tradition in Brazil that if you gave a scientific paper, you gave it in Portuguese, right? So there was a, a, a strong push, you know, to engage that way. Uh, and I remember this must be late seventies now, Interciencia had a meeting on the Amazon in Beilang, the port city, the one that I had actually been based in for my PhD. Uh, and having a meeting on the Amazon as a foreign organization was, was not something that people were, at least not all of them were happy about. And certainly there were a whole bunch of students all riled up and um, and they were they were making a lot of noise as the time came for me to give my talk. And I got up and I said, "Os problemas da Amazonia são a mesma em qualquer língua. Problems of the Amazon are the same in whatever language." And it brought the house down. <laughs> You know, <laughs> and I did give my talk in Portuguese, but nowadays I I try not to because my Portuguese is, even though I understand it quite well, you know, have it come out of my mouth with complicated thoughts doesn't work too well. Uh, and if I really, really have to give a speech in Portuguese, I will write it out in my simple Portuguese and have somebody correct it because I tried the other way around doing doing it in English and then trying to read the translation and then there are always words there I never got in my mouth around before so uh, so that that's where it is today and you know English has become so much the lingua franca of, of science that it's much much less of a problem if you were entering graduate school today, is there anything that you would do or study uh, that's different from what you did when you did it the first time around? Well, I suspect I would want to take some courses in things like conservation biology, which didn't even exist then. Uh, that said, you know, uh, everybody who I've looked up to in my graduate experience, uh, all cared about conservation or environment one way or another. You know, Dylan Ripley would say, you know, any science, any biologist with a conscience should spend some time on conservation. And I had the extraordinary great fortune to be the last legal student of G. Evelyn Hutchinson, the founder of modern ecology, uh, who was just an, an incredible mind. Uh, but he also cared about these things. You know, he once, he once flew overnight to London to speak at a Royal Society meeting trying to protect Aldabra tortoises from uh the construction of an air base uh and they succeeded actually um and i found recently that as long ago as 1941 he talked about climate change and in a in testimony in the congress including you know the role of forests and all of that uh, so it was, 
it sort of predisposed me. Uh, if I had wanted, uh, had different interests, so, well, I probably wouldn't have, but, uh, and so I was predisposed and fell into that WWF job and uh, that was exceedingly transformational. And it turned out Dylan Ripley was the chair of the board, right? Um, if there were one event or thing or you know um, theme from your career that you would like to have long remembered into the future, uh, what would it be? Well, you know, uh, you no. Know, if I've been a professor my whole life, uh, I would have, you know, I'd obviously say my students. Uh, and, you know, they would, be, even though I started much, much, much later, they would be part of that answer. Um, but I would hope it would be something about encountering a problem or a new way of looking at things. Uh, and then, then trying to figure out you know, how to improve the science around it and where appropriate, make it actionable. So, that, I mean, that's how I got into 30 years ago or so, you know, looking at climate change and biodiversity, you could barely see any real impact at that point, but you could tell that it was coming. So I, with Rob Peters, we put together the first meeting on that subject in 1987, and then turned that into the first book ever on the subject. Uh, and now, of course, you can't fix climate change without fixing some of the biology of the planet. And literally half of the terrestrial vegetation's apostrophe S carbon is in the atmosphere. It's literally equal pretty much to what remains. Uh, I'm the only one so far who sort of puts it that way. Uh, everybody always throws out numbers, but that's what it is. And that says something really attention getting. And there's no way we can actually get to a soft landing of one and a half degrees without some major ecosystem restoration, probably about a third of that carbon from destroyed terrestrial ecosystems has to come back. But it can, you know, and that's what's so great. Yeah, I've not heard of that characterization very frequently, but just to make sure that I've got it right. So uh, the way one way to think about carbon is that which is in the atmosphere is that which was previously in the ecosystems, and if we want to, you know, restore the atmosphere to its previous state, we need to bring it back into the ecosystems. Yeah, I mean, suck it all back. It, it is not often characterized as a problem in that sense. Yeah, I mean, it, it's floating around now as nature-based solutions, uh, but everybody's always very cautious about it. I mean, I. I think you got to just state it as it is, which is, you know, half of it's in the atmosphere and a significant portion needs to come back. That's very powerful messaging. Um, and I suppose this will probably be our last question, but, and it, and it may relate to the idea of, um, you know, transforming, you know, uh, ideas into, you know, something that's actionable for science. Uh, but do you have any advice for young scientists who are just entering the field? So I would say that throw yourself into it. Uh, it's a glorious experience. Uh, you learn all kinds of things. And just make sure that you take time to learn how to explain it to other people. Uh, so the more people appreciate what science brings to the world. And th that's, a, I think, a great note on which to leave it. Uh, Dr. Lovejoy, thank you very much for joining me today. Really enjoyed it. 
And that concludes this episode of Bioscience Talks. Just a reminder, the journal Bioscience is published by Oxford University Press on behalf of the American Institute of Biological Sciences and is made possible by the support of our members and donors. Thank you, and talk to you next time.